Sometimes the singing of songs mirrors what happens in our lives. There's ups and downs, right? And so when we think about our ups and downs, I can't imagine living this life without having Jesus in it. I don't know how people get through life not relying upon Jesus, not thinking about Jesus, not understanding who he is and what he is here to provide us. And as I think about the things of life that you and I have experienced, I'm thankful that Jesus is in my life. I'm thankful for that. But as we consider 1 John that we've been looking at the past several weeks, I want to be mindful of, again, uh, about the theme of the book. The theme of the book is about assurance. And John is writing to a group of people who have been troubled, troubled by false teachers who are teaching false doctrine. And they're troubled by the break in fellowship that took place. Remember, John t- says that they left us. They left us because they weren't of us. Had they been of us, they would not have left. But they left, so they were not of us. I find that interesting. But I also find it necessary when we consider the fellowship that God desires. Because in 1 John chapter 1, the idea of fellowship is spelled out immediately in verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that beautiful? And so in that particular group of people, however... There was a group of people that had had arisen from within teaching false doctrine. And so therefore they were no longer walking in the light. And therefore had no longer had the fellowship with the brethren there because of their sin. And because of that they no longer had fellowship with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the point John is making. So he's writing them to assure them that they have been doing that. They have been walking in the light. They are children of God. And I found it interesting. I was having a little talk this morning with Brother Caden. And Caden came up to me and he said, you know, I find it really interesting that John is talking about being born again. That he's talking about being born of God. And that that when we're born again, we live inside his righteousness. Now that's coming from a young man. Can you imagine how many people in the world don't understand that concept? But the concept is, I'm not living by my righteousness, I'm living by his righteousness. And so we live within the confines of the righteousness of Christ. And that within the confines, when we mess up, that's for those of you who are more technically sound, when we sin, the blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness because we are within the sphere of the righteousness of Christ. That's how the Father sees us through the lens of Jesus, his Son. He sees us pure. He sees us clean all because of the blood of Christ. And much of the world is missing out on that because they have not received Jesus into their lives. They have not accepted his word and they have not obeyed his gospel and therefore they miss out on all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus. Before we go any further, I just want to note that uh, Harold Alberts will be going in for a procedure on Wednesday, so let's, let's add that to our prayer list and, prayer list and uh, keep him in our prayers as he goes in for that procedure. And also, as, uh, as Brother Don was mentioning, you know, all the troubles going on in the world in Afghanistan and the catastrophes of earthquakes in Haiti, and now we're approaching the hurricane season one more time and it's bearing down on the coast of the Gulf Coast. Uh, we need to remember them in prayer. So before I even go any further, I'd like to pray for those things. So let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we can be here today to worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, we're so thankful that you have provided us an avenue whereby we can talk to you, 
that we can deliver to you our most ardent desires, even our most ardent fears, that we can petition you with anything that's on our mind and in our hearts. Father, we're grateful for that. We're grateful that you love us, that you want us to come to you and to talk to you and to tell us our problems and to share them with you because you're the only person that can help. And Father, at this time as we're mindful of things going on in the Middle East, in particular in Afghanistan, Father, we pray that you be with the world leaders and the leaders of the Taliban and the leaders of this country and all those countries in the area that you prick their hearts, Father, that they may strive for peace and, Father, that no more bloodshed will take place. And, Father, help us to continue to pray for our own leaders of this country. Father, we know it's not easy to do the work that they're doing. And, Father, we often let politics get in the way of things, and yet they still need our prayers. And, Father, we pray for our leaders, our president. We pray for his cabinet. We pray for all those in leading positions within our government, that you be with them and that they might turn for you, turn to you for answers and, and that you may guide them in all that they say and do. And Father, even those who have no faith in you who are leading in our country, we pray, Father, that through your divine providence, others might inf influence them and that they might humble themselves to receive their opinion and the suggestions, Father. And Father, we pray that you be with those who are at this time about to experience another hurricane. We pray, Father, that you be with all those people, that you give them strength and courage and, and, and Father, peace of mind that, that you are the God of all comfort and that all the things in this life, all the material blessings that we enjoy, Father, are just simply material things. We know they come from you, but Father, we, we know that there's, far, there's things far more important than the material. We know that those are the spiritual things. We pray, Father, that all those in that area will rely upon you and your strength. And Father, we pray that you be with all those involved in our in, in the uh, Afghanistan conflict, Father. We pray that you be with our soldiers, both our men and women, and our leaders, that they make the right decisions and the right choices, Father, and protect them, Father, if it be thy will. Father, there's so many things happening in this world, especially now with COVID, and we see all these things emerging at once, and Father, we know that it could be a terrible catastrophe with all these things coming in at one time, but Father, we know that you love us, that there is a reason, Father, for these things, and that through it all, help us to rely upon you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we consider about what Brother Caden was telling me about being born of God, about, about living within that righteousness, I'm reminded of a story of a girl, a little girl who was in her elementary school and she was assigned a topic for an essay and she had to write this essay on, on, uh, on birth and about uh, children being born. And so the essay was on her mind, and as she came home, she asked her, her mother, and said, uh, Mom, where, do, uh, where did I come from? How was I, how was I born? And Mom looked at her and said, in her motherly guidance, and said, Why, honey, you came from a stork. The stork delivered you. The stork brought you. And so she had a puzzling look on her face, and she said, Well... What about you and dad? Where did you and dad come from? She said, well, we came from the stork too. The stork brought us, just like the stork, stork brought you. And she said, well, what about grandma and grandpa? Well, the stork brought them too. So she went away and she wrote her essay and she handed it in to the teacher. And she said to the teacher, you know, this is one of the more, most difficult things that I've had to write about. Because evidently, in our family, we've had three generations that didn't have a natural childbirth. <laughs> well, it's important to know our birth. 
It's important to know where we came from because it tells us who we are, right? And that's what John here is telling the people here. We need to know something about our birth so that we can know something about our worth. And God here is telling the people, you're worth something to me. And we just got done sharing this spiritual meal together. And this spiritual meal tells us just how much we are worth to God. And isn't it a beautiful thing that we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ? We're bound by the blood of Jesus Christ. We come together and give thanks to our Father who sent his Son, our elder brother, who died in our place and has given us eternal life. Every Lord's Day, we ought to be here with a happy smile on our face doing that. And I know that's pie in the sky sometimes. But you know what? As Brother Roy was talking about the things that take place in this life, we ought to be happy people, right? And that's true. You know, we go through death. We see people suffer. We have loved ones who die. We go through failures in our own lives. We do so many things wrong. We have mess-ups. And yet we know, and this is what John is pointing out to the folks here, we know we have eternal life. So, in the end, what does it all matter? Except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what matters. And that is a blessing that we share together as brethren in Christ. And so, I want us to go to the passage that Caden had read and just look at it together a little bit. He says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I'd like to think about that for just a second because John is going back, and in this little book of five chapters, he mentions being born of God six times. And then he mentions born of him once. So, referring to God. So, seven times, he says, born of God. So, he's taking the people back in memory to their birth. Their spiritual birth in God. It's kind of similar to what, how John was talking about in the Gospel of John. Where he goes back to the very beginning of time, talking about this, if you will, new birth called creation. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without Him, nothing that was made in this world that was made, except everything be made by Him. And that, imagine that, that the Lord Jesus Christ is also the Creator. The Creator of heaven and earth, the Creator of human beings, the Creator, the creator of animal life, all life. That he is the creator. And he goes back to in the beginning. Talking about creation. And there in the garden. The father desired to have this relationship with his grand creation. Man. And it was a pleasure for God. As he walked along with man in the garden. And they would walk and talk together. As the song goes on to say. And so this, this serpent comes along, Satan, and he tempts Adam and Eve, and they fail the test. Now, what we have to understand is that in the beginning of creation, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That's important. Because the creation there, the new birth, if you will, is that mankind was created in the image of God. But Satan came along and stole all that, marred, marred the image of God in our lives and in our hearts, took away that image and corrupted that image that we should have had. Now you think about the marred image. And I think about Isaiah chapter 52 and about verse 14, where it says that his visage, 
talking about the appearance of Jesus Christ. His visage, his visage, his appearance was marred more than any other. And there he's talking about how this man was beaten to a pulp before he was even hung on the cross. And now he's not talking about people who have been beaten up in life by other men, but he's talking about this man who endured the cross, that everyone before him that went to a cross, not his cross, but went to a cross, was not beaten like this man was beaten. Jesus, his image was marred on our behalf. Then we learn that God, wanting to restore the relationship he had with man in the beginning, sent his son, right, when the moment was just right. But when the, fullness, when the moment of the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman, to be born under the law. At the appropriate time, he sent his son to do that. To restore the image that was marred, he had to mar his own image. Imagine that. And through that image, we have the image of God retained once again in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, through his sacrifice. And so again, John comes back and he says, that's what happened. You were born of God. And you are now in the image of the God once again. You have that restored in your lives. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. And so John is pointing out this grand blessing that we all enjoy today. But the short term consequence. As John writes here, he says this. And now little children abide in him that we that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed. You remember in the garden when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, that they were ashamed before their father because they knew they were naked now. They had this knowledge, this understanding because they ate of that tree that God told them not to. And of course, you remember when God came, why are you hiding from me? Why are you hiding from me? Well, we're naked. We don't, we don't want you to see us that way. Well, that's exactly what Christ came for us. We don't have to be ashamed before the Father. No matter what we have done in life, no matter what we might do in life, we no longer have to be ashamed. Why? Just like Brother Caden said, because we are living within the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember, it's not about my righteousness or your righteousness. It's about his righteousness and what he did on the cross. That's why our obedience is not meriting God's favor. That's why our obedience is not something that's legalistic that we have to do. No, it's something that God provides for us to do as an expression of faith and love. And when we fail, we have his blood. In fact, if I could say it in our own vernacular, Christ has our back. Christ has our back when we fall. And that is a joy and a blessing, surely for us to understand. And so as we continue, he says, now, we don't have to be shamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness. I find it interesting there that the word there for practice also means works, right? Works, righteousness is born of him, born of him. Behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Notice that. Doesn't Peter tell us that we are a peculiar people to all our friends, to all our family, 
to all those in the community, to all those in the world that don't live in Christ Jesus, they find it peculiar that you're a little strange, a little off, a little off kilter because you don't behave in the manner that others do. No, because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, follow me, not the world. And so we follow Jesus and we put our hope in him. And that demonstrates not only to the world, but to God that we are also children of God. And he says, beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, that's when he comes again, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. As we consider this idea of being born again. I want to point out that the born again idea is a concept of a process. It's something that has steps, if you will. You remember in Romans chapter 4 and verse 12, Paul says that we walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. If Abraham proceeded in life through steps of faith. And so therefore, like Abraham, we proceed through our life by steps of faith. Was Abraham's steps of faith always perfect? No. We can read about the mistakes in Abraham's life. In fact, Abraham might take two steps forward and three steps back. But he kept proceeding onward. And so it is with us. We fall, we stumble, we sin, but we get back up. We ask forgiveness and we move on. And we try to be more Christ-like every day. And that's where the righteousness of God comes in. The righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ who molds us and makes us after his image. And so God is still restoring the image that we're made in. The image of God in our lives. So the idea of being born again, let's talk about that for just a few minutes. Because I know this is a happy day. And as Brother Roy said, it's a happy day because of Jesus. And I agree with that 100%. But I will add one little caveat. It's a happy day because of chicken. Chicken today is a happy day. So I hope you plan to stay and enjoy some chicken with us. A chicken fellowship dinner. Colossians chapter 1. Notice what Paul says. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins... He is the image of the invisible God. We have redemption through his blood. That blood holds the image of Jesus Christ. That's the image when the blood of Christ is applied to our hearts that the Father sees. The image of Christ. And so that's a process that involves a lot. We're born of God and therefore that begins the faith process now notice what jesus will say here in john chapter 3 jesus answered and said to him nicodemus most assuredly i say to you unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of god nicodemus said to him how can a man be born when he is old can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born and jesus answered most assuredly i say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I have a feeling that Nicodemus is not talking about natural birth process here. Not talking about merely entering the, his mother's womb again to be born. But as a Jew, as a Jew who was born from his mother's womb, they have eternal life. Simply, and primarily because of the birth. They were born into the family of God. God chose the Jews. So if you were a baby born from your mom. And you came into the world. 
You were a Jew. You were chosen, and therefore you were saved. And Jesus responds, but most assuredly I say to you, everyone that is born of water, literally out of water and out of spirit, will enter, uh, will not enter, cannot enter in the kingdom of God. So we have to be born out of water and we have to be born out of spirit. What does that mean? Well, if we look in the same context, two chapters later, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son, that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, number one, and believes in him who sent me, number two, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, number three, but has passed from death into life, and those who hear will live. That's the process of being born again. Born out of water, born out of the Spirit. What's he talking about? Born out of the Spirit means born out of the teachings that the, spirits provide, that the Spirit provided through inspired men. That message from inspired men told all men to be baptized. Just as Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Therein lies the change, a spiritual change from death unto life. And then we come into John chapter 6, one chapter later. And Jesus says, it is the Spirit who gives life. Jesus just said, I give life. Now he says, it's the Spirit that gives life. Well, how does Jesus give life? How does the Spirit give life? Well, he tells us. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit And they are life. Oh. So we get life from the Father who gives the words to Jesus. And it's the Spirit that gives the words to mankind. And through those words, when we submit to them, when we believe them, when we accept them by faith, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, faith comes through the Word. So you have to. Here and you have to listen and you have to mull it over in your mind and you have to understand, do I really want that or not? Do I really believe that or not? Either way, salvation comes through the word of God. That's the point. That's the point when he says it's the spirit who gives life and even when it says that Jesus gives eternal life. When folks obey his word, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. You accept them. You have that life that Jesus promised. But moreover, in Ephesians chapter 5, or uh, I think I passed that. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 5, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, out of water, out of spirit. Here it says, washing of water, washing out of water by the word. The word of God instructs us to be washed in the blood of Christ by being washed in the waters of baptism. That's what he's talking about here. James chapter 1, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. That he might be kind of the kind of first fruits of his creatures. But notice he says that he brought us forth. The word there is to beget, to begot. He begotten us. The only begotten son of the father. Well, he begot us. How? Through the word. But I thought we were born out of water and out of spirit. Yes. Through the word. Though spirit gives the teachings... The teachings give the means. The means is being baptized. When you see that, you obey it, you do it. You've been born again by the word. And so we become a child of God. Remember, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
What? For it, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation for everyone. There's no exceptions. No exceptions. Everyone has a right to hear the word of God and to believe the word of God. But not everyone will hear the word of God and not everyone will believe the word of God. And so the only thing that separates the people from the masses is being brought forth or begotten or being born again by the word of God. Notice what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Well, how, how Peter, did we... Purify our souls in obeying the truth. Well, you did what Jesus said. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. How can you not be saved and not purified? You're purified by the blood of Christ when we obey the Lord's commands. And notice he says, you've obeyed the truth, having been born again. There's that connection. There's a connection between being born again and obeying the truth. And that gets back to, again, John chapter 3 and verse 5. Being born out of water and out of the Spirit. Well, quite simply, I would say it this way. Born out of water, born out of the teaching of the Spirit. But that's understood because the Spirit is a a word that stands for what the Spirit brings, which is instruction. And that's exactly how the people on Pentecost were saved. Was it not? Right? How were they saved that day? Peter got up and he started preaching. That preaching, that message that he preached that day, hurt them inside in their hearts. Because they just got told by Peter, you crucified the Lord. You crucified the very Messiah whom you were waiting for. And so how do they respond? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responds, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. To be purified. To be born again. To have the blessings of the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin and from all unrighteousness. And then we come back to where we began. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The whole purpose of assurance is to know what you have done. You have done what the Lord has asked you to do. Like Paul says at the end of his life, he says, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. And we too, when we keep the faith, that is, when we do what the Lord has asked us to do in the manner that he has asked us to do it in, we can be assured and confident. And we don't have to be ashamed as we wait for the Lord. We have the image of God implanted on our minds and our hearts by virtue of the new birth that we have in Jesus Christ. You can have that assurance today if you so desire. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can take that all the way to your grave and into eternity. And know for a fact that those words will forever stand. The word of God will last forever, as well as his promises. If you believe that, you desire that, you have that opportunity this morning. If you've done that, but perhaps you have wandered, perhaps you have not been as faithful as you possibly could. Jesus says, there's still a remedy. It's called his blood. His blood still works and operates in your life upon repentance and confession. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ Jesus this morning, why don't you come forward as together we stand and sing.